So, Hashat Chukat. Chukat, Zot Chukat Torah. This is the the law of the Torah. Uh, in this parasha, perhaps the most astonishing and appalling and unexpected thing happens. Uh, Moshe suddenly finds himself in the position of not leading the people into Eretz Israel. That's at least how it reads. Because he struck the rock, he didn't speak to the rock, that's what we want to be looking at. But what is there's no question about is the drastic nature of God's response. That God answers after, after the water has actually flowed from the rock. God then says to Moshe in a very absolute way, Ya'an lohem mantendi, because you didn't believe me. There's that word emuna again. Because you didn't believe me, l'hakdisheni le'enei b'nei Yisrael, to sanctify me before the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this community into the land. And that's the first, the first mention of this decree. Moshe didn't know anything about this before, and clearly it has something to do with what happens in front of the rock. Something, ex- something mysterious and, in, I think, truly incomprehensible happens in front of the rock. Like a chukah. That is, this whole parsha is about the nature of inexorable things that happen, inexorable decrees, which are engraved, as it were, in stone, the chakek, the chokek, that things, there they are, they're engraved in stone. You don't understand them. They don't have any explanation offered, really, with them, although they sound as if they have God's full meaning behind them. But from a human point of view, there is a sense of being totally baffled. Now, that's the nature of chukim in general, that they're not, they're not part of natural law. They're laws that simply that God has decreed. Uh, that's the nature of law. And then there are the chukim in reality, the experiences of God communicating through the things he decides, through his decisions, through his uh, dark revelations, but not fully communicating. At any rate, one doesn't understand. Nishtomem libenu. That's the expression that one of the medieval philosophers uses. Our hearts are thrown into shmama, are thrown into, are devastated. It's a very strong expression. When we think of this sudden fate falling on Moshe without obvious reason. And I'm... I'm interested in this subject subject in general. I want to start off with a semi-personal, I don't know if I'll put it in personal terms so much, but this is a a question that's always been with me. The nature of the meeting between a person, a people, and a revelation. Question of what happens when God reveals himself at Har Sinai, at, at Mount Sinai, And the purpose of the revelation, of this visitation from beyond, something that's beyond the human realm, what I might call the sublime, thinking of the romantic poets and uh, and the romantic philosophers, as it were, like, like Kant, I don't know if he's ever been called a romantic philosopher, who considers this question of what happens when the sublime is experienced in the human world. Uh, the, the, the problem is that the sublime comes with enormous force. It comes with enormous force, and it may well knock out the human being who is trying to understand it, who is trying to receive it. That is, there is Matan Torah, there is the revelation of God, the giving of the Torah, but every giving, every gift has to have a receiver, has to have someone who is able to accept the gift. And so the expression Kabbalah Torah, Kabbalah Torah, accepting Torah, receiving Torah, we tend to use rather blithely. Yes, all right, you give it to me, I'll take it. We have, we have, a, we have negotiated. Whereas, in fact, one can give a gift that is never really received. Because to be received means that the person receiving is willing to allow what has happened, what has been given, to enter fully into his experience, into her experience, actually to change the structure of one's feeling. I want to use that expression. 
to change one from who one was to who one is from now on. That, that's what Kabbalat Torah would be. And in a small way, that's what it would mean every time. Um, there is a receiving consciousness, receiving what I'm calling the sublime, something that comes with enormous, in a way, unexplained force from the world. What does it take to receive from uh, Walter Benjamin? The uh, German Jewish philosopher uh, noticed that after the First World War, for many years, soldiers seemed to be coming back from the war without stories to tell, without anything to report, as if something enormous had happened to them, perhaps many enormous things, shattering things. And somehow, just because they were so enormous, the soldiers somehow couldn't put it all together, couldn't present a surface, a receiving surface that would register what had happened. And so when I talk about Kabbalah Tatora, or the, the, the ability to be, to accept what is being offered, I'm talking really about uh, an ability to have a deep inner self that is capable of changing and opening and becoming more sensitive, registering better and more finally, more finely, not finally, more finely what has been on offer. And this, of course, is true on many levels. It's true, it's true within human life. It's true in the relationship between man and woman, between friends, between any, anyone who comes and offers something big and the person who is there receiving. What very often happens, and this is the negative story that troubles me, and it troubles me in the Torah, and it troubles me in life too, what very often happens, more often than not, I would think, is that there's a kind of numbness in the receiver. That the receiver doesn't exactly say no, but doesn't really get it, doesn't really, and isn't prepared somewhere to open himself, herself, to the depth of what has been given. And that means, in a way, to deepen oneself. Now, this, this theme of a kind of resistance, here is someone trying to mark the surface. Let's say it's God trying to make a mark on the people and say, I've been here, and I've left my, my Roshan on you. I've left my imprint on you. And what happens then is that the surface not only doesn't register the mark, but actually that there's a sort of real resistance that the surface breaks up in some way, the surface blurs, it really repels the mark. And that, in a sense, is what we read. I don't think we can, we can really deny it throughout Sefer Bamidbar uh, and in Sefer Shemot as well. It starts then already. The resistance of the people to what is on offer. But, of course, Sefer Bamidbar is more important because it's after Matan Torah. And there are the serial refusals, and we've been tracing them these last few weeks. Um, I wanted to say something general about this because I think it's not only true in the Torah, obviously. I think this is the problem of Kabbalah. It's the problem of a relationship in which something has been offered, something big, something enormous, I'm calling it sublime, and then the receiving side in some way not only closes off, but in some way tries to invalidate, tries to block out what has been offered. And so then the, the, the problem of both giver and receiver is to find a way of breaking through this situation of a kind of stupor, a kind of stupor in which the receiver is not really getting it, stupor, incomprehension, a kind of blank. And what's needed sometimes is some kind of a shock, perhaps a, a benign shock to overcome the resistance. And God seems to try very hard in this sense. Where is Moshe in all this? On whose side is he? He's somewhere in between. He's trying to translate God to the people. And he's trying to defend and justify the people back to God. And what we have then, which is disturbing and in a way doesn't seem to find its resolution so, so, so easily, what we have then is a sense of a kind of hollowing out that the people, right, it's the same thing over and over again till we get used to their language. And they have got used to a certain kind of, in a way, very alive language of resistance, 
no, we need to eat, we need to drink, uh, we're afraid of death. On the other hand, why didn't we die earlier? What I would almost call a kind of death wish on the part of the people, yeah, which you, you actually read there in the story of the spy, Lou Magnum, if only we had died, which that structure, I think, is really backed by much of what we've learned uh, since Freud, but in psychoanalysis, the role of the death wish in human life and the way in which, in some way, it uh, resists the erotic, it re resists the force of life, and in some way actually shows it up, you feel it more, more sublimely in some, in some way. Uh, George Eliot, in her great works, particularly in Middlemarch and Daniel de Ronda, but throughout her work, and here I mustn't allow myself to go off track too much, um, I, I wrote on her for my doctorate. And this was the theme that I was interested in at that time. It, I certainly didn't connect it to the Torah at that time, but the theme was, it was a theme of what she calls moral stupidity. How common that is. It's not intellectual stupidity. It's a kind of stupid. It's a kind of numbness and nothingness with which people react to what is really claiming their attention. How can you not notice this if you, if you are a moral being? It's a question of moral imagination. And I want to bring this back now to our story here. Because here, there seems to be very good reason for the people feeling that they don't begin to understand um, what, 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 what is happening in the story. And we as readers feel that we don't really understand and we are left in some way, in some way numb. What do we have at the beginning of the story? Beginning of chapter 20 um, in, uh, in, in Sefer Bamidbar. We read, and we can, we can look at the source pages already, uh, Ariel, if you bring it up on the screen. Um, we read, The whole of Bnei Israel, the whole community, came to the wilderness of Sin in the first month, and they stayed there in this place called Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And immediately after the story proper begins, there was no water for the community, and they all gang up against Moshe. Have a look at Rashi, number one. Here it is. Kol Ha'ida. The whole community, they all arrived at this place. Kadesh. Why the emphasis on Kol Ha'ida? The whole congregation, the congregation in its integrity, that is, Eida HaShlema, the full, everybody who was going to be alive from the, and to enter the land, that is, the organic community, the survivors, they came to this place, which tells us, and it's a rather shocking piece of information, that all those who were supposed to die in the wilderness had already died by this time. That is, 40 years have passed, and we haven't noticed it. We haven't noticed it. Is that our moral stupidity? Or is that actually the way the Torah tells the story? The Torah tells the story in such a way that you don't notice that 40 years are passing. There's no sense of the passage of time in terms of chapters, the very few chapters in the Torah since the decree that everyone would die, since the story of the spies. And now suddenly, whoop, we've arrived. Uh, it's a kind of shock, a shock effect here. Suddenly, we are jolted alert. We should know it. Is that better? Yes, Aviva, thank you. Much better. Is it okay? Yes. yes. Um, I can't see myself. Um, uh, the, the people have actually, the, the dying has all been done. All the dying, tamu, tamu, tamu. That's the way it's put uh, in, in the Torah just a bit later. They had all finished dying, as if that's what they were busy doing in the meantime and we hadn't noticed because no point is made of it in the Torah itself. And so suddenly we're shocked awake. Oh, and we, oh, they've all died. The elu pirshu l'chayim. But these ones, I don't like the translation here. I think pirshu means they had set, the ones, the remainder, those who are alive now, they had set off towards life now. These ones are the residue. These are, this is the crystalline 
this is a crystalline residue of what's been left over after all the dying is done. So that's why it's called Kol Ha'eda, the whole community. We're dealing with the community of the future. Now, this is a community that will live and will go into, into Eretz Israel. And in, in, in this sense, then, we have, we have a sense now that it's these people now, it's like the selected, those who were, who were, were under 20 and a few others, now have lived their 40 years in the wilderness, and now they are the community that are, are ready to move, to move on, to, to separate themselves out from the community of death. And so it seems as if death has had its way, and now we're dealing with life. Now we're dealing with the, the, the movement on into life, and we hadn't noticed this momentous historical crisis. It has to be pointed out to us in this subtlety of the reading, Kol Haida, and Rashi's, Rashi's uh, reading, reading on it. We have thought everything is continuous. In a way, we were under the spell of narrative, one story after another, and a feeling in a way of life or history as flux. It just keeps going. It gets better, it gets worse. Uh, it, it, that's certainly one way in which one experiences life. Nothing really changes. But suddenly there is a moment of shock and one realizes that something has changed, that really the face of the community has changed entirely. There is hardly a recognizable face at the end of the 40 years. These are different people, right? Either they are newborns who have grown up or they are the older generation um, who have survived. And so there is this sense again of having to reorganize ourselves to read the story differently. Ah, these are the ones who now come and complain that they don't have water. And so there's a kind of continuity with the past because the, the, their parents were always complaining of that too, that we don't have water. And here they are again complaining, we don't have water. They, it's true that they do say some other things. They quarrel with Moshe and they say, if only we had died when our brothers died in the presence of God. And that is a kind of hidden reference to the death of, of the, the older generation. Um, that in some of all the various deaths that had happened, we wish we had been among them. Why did you bring this community of God to this wilderness to die there, we and our cattle? And there is a really animal sense, which doesn't, that people seem to share, of existential danger that we're going to die in this desert. Nothing much has changed, it seems, on that level. Why did you bring us up from Egypt to bring us to this evil place, which is not a place of Zera, Uteinab, Gefen, Marimon? And here are mentioned fruits, which are the fruits of Eretz Israel. And now, basically, what this generation is saying, which differentiates it from the previous generation, is that it's not just the terror of the desert that troubles them, and it's not a desire to return to Egypt so much as we expected to be there in that wonderful place. And we now have a, a we have a desire to be there, and you haven't brought us yet. Instead, we are here in this place of drought. And so there's a disappointment here about a not yet fulfilled future. And then Moshe and Aaron came from the presence of the community. And the Ibn Ezra reads that, that they came at the, as, as, as fugitives, that they were fleeing from the presence of the community, that in some way they really felt threatened by the community at this point, as if they are a kind of lynch mob. And they come to the entrance of the tent of assembly and they fall on their faces yet again. I think this is the fourth time, it's four times altogether in Sefer Bar that Moshe and Aaron fall on their faces. Falling on their faces, what does that suggest? Again, a kind of despair, a kind of speechlessness. And the glory of God appears to them, not to anyone else. But in this case, there is a revelation that's personal to them. A kind of too muchness. Something excessive happens. It's not described in terms of the senses, what it was like. And God then says to Moshe, take that stick, take the stick and lead the, com com the community, you and Aaron, gather the community and speak to the rock before their eyes and it will give forth its water. And then you will bring forth water for them from the rock and you will give the community to drink has a certain tenderness, this, 
You will bring forth water for them. You will be in attention. You will be tending to them like good parents. This is what you should do. And it all fo focuses on take the stick and speak to the rock. That's the command. And then you'll be able to give them water they need, the community, and their cattle. And there's a separation between those two. I think the Mishnah Chokma points that out, as if to say that this is a human community who are differentiated. And their thirst is a human thirst, and the cattle have a different sense. Okay, that's the promise. That's the command, and that's the promise. And then we get what Moshe does. He takes the staff from the presence of God. And the presence of God really means from Nifnei Ha'edut, from before the Ark, the Aaron in the Holy of Holies, where it's been in storage. Now, that's, uh, that's something that perhaps we're not react we haven't reacted to in the past. They take it from the place where it's been off-seen, right? It's been retired, retired from active, active service. For many years, we haven't heard of the stick, the stick of government, the staff of, of, of power. And, but Moshe obeys God. God said, take it. So he takes it as God had commanded him. Everything is fine. Everything makes sense up to this point. And then Moshe and Aaron gather the people to face the rock, El Pnei Hasela. And then Moshe says to the people, listen now, you rebels. Shall we really draw forth for you water from this rock? Shall we extract water from the rock for you? And clearly that's a, a, sarcastic, it's a sarcastic statement. In some way, he's reproaching them. He says, you're complaining, you're rebels yet again. And are we really going to get wet water for you? And Moshe lifted up his hand and he smote the rock with his staff twice. Twice. And the water, much water, Ma'im Rabin, came forth, not just some water, as God had promised, but a lot of water. And the community and their cattle drank. That sounds like a story with a happy ending. That is the terrible turn of the story is saved for right at the end. Up to this point, the people get their water, they get more water than God had promised, actually. Um, everything is really wonderful. And the people drank, and what could be better as a conclusion to the story? Except that God then says to Moshe and Aaron that terrible sentence in more than one sense that, that I, I mentioned before. Because you have not believed in me to sanctify me before the eyes of the children of Israel. Failed to happen here because of you. There was something in how you dealt with this moment that made emuna fail to happen. Lahamin is in itself a causative verb. Lahamin. And the hakdish is to cause holiness. They are both causative words. So I think we're well within our right to translate, not so much that Moshe didn't believe in God, but you didn't create faith, and you didn't create kedusha, holiness, the sanctification of God, Israel, before the eyes of the children of Israel. That's why you shall not bring this people into the land. And that's where you have, I, I, I sort of said it before, but I'll say it again. That's where you have a kind of real tension between the almost, almost over clear explanatory nature of this diagnosis. God makes it very clear why they will not take people into the land. You didn't believe in me. You didn't, you didn't create trust. You didn't create a sense of holiness. You, Hashem. you failed an opportunity, and that's why you will not be the, the leaders of the people. And that sounds so lucid. It's a very almost like a geometrical, you know, what you write at the end, ergo. You know, because it's therefore, because this, then that. The only problem is that we don't know, have an idea of what it could mean. What have Moshe and Aaron failed to do? Yeah. After all, God did say, take the stuff. And they did it as God had commanded. Kasher Tzivahu. But then it seems something happens after that that was not as God wanted. So what happens after that? Well, it could say two things. 
And on these two things depend uh, the two main interpretations that we find throughout the ages of what Moshe and Aaron do wrong. One is that, of course, that they smite the rock, and God never said to smite the rock. God said, speak to the rock. And here there's a lot of discussion in many different commentaries, um, to the point that uh, the Orachayim, for instance, a uh, great 18th century commentary of the Torah, um, <clears throat> says he's counted, I think he said, 10 different, really distinct uh, interpretations, 10 different suggestions of what Moshe's sin was. Some, somewhere, that, if you, that it, this kind of overkill, right? It's over-explained. And what, we, what happens now is that anyone who comes to, to read this story and is not satisfied by any of, the, by any of those explanations, and they all con contradict each other, they, all, they, are not, uh, they, they don't in any way include each other, um, and comes with an 11th explanation. So what are we doing then? All we're doing is heaping more and more sins we're using a magnifying glass to, to detect sins to heap on Moshe's head. Is that a constructive exercise? And why, why are we doing this? Just to try to find, find that, to make sense, <clears throat> to make sense of a story that we don't find has been satisfactorily explained by anyone who's come to us. Because by the very nature of the beast, the very nature of this event, it's an event that doesn't have an easy explanation. It can't be explained away. Any interpretation is going to have to swallow some bitter pills. It's going to have to include some complex ideas that are not so easy to take in, to, to absorb in, into oneself. And so here, um, um, there, there is a, a passage in the Gemara and Kiddushin that says something like this, well, here we have a table, and we have a knife, and we have the meat. We have everything set up. Shulchan Aruch. We know exactly what happened in the story. We know what God wanted of Moshe. We know what he did. And we know what the punishment was. But in man peh. It's a wonderful, a wonderful midrash there in, in, in the Talmud. But we don't have the mouth to eat the meal. We don't have a mouth that's the other use of a mouth. In other words, it all seems, we seem to have all the data, but we can't really understand why, what happened here. And there you have it in classic form. So one explanation is, all right, they hit the rock instead of speaking to it. The other classic explanation is the Rambam, and he is, he is, this is with his explanation, that Moshe was angry with the people. He was clearly angry when he spoke to them in the way he spoke. Listen now, you, you rebel. Are we going to bring forth water from you for you? For that? Sounded sounds angry. Um, and Moshe was angry with the people, and this is a, a this extraordinary interpretation. Moshe was angry with the people at a moment when God was not angry with the people. If you look at, uh, well, we just read it. God was not angry with people. God said, no, you should bring out water and you should give them the water. God wasn't phased by the people's rebellion on this occasion. And he only told Moshe to do certain things and he, was, he had no problem with people. And so when Moshe spoke to the people in an angry way, he was misrepresenting God. That's the way the Rampam reads it. And that's quite serious. That he is, after all, the, he is the, uh, the bridge between he is the interpreter of God to the people. And in his, that anger was a kind of private anger. There was something there that came out in that anger. And that's what skews the story now. Uh, which is expressed in a different sense, you might say, in his striking the rock. And we will come to that. We will see that in the end, that's how Maharal reads the story. That it's really all one story and has one meaning. It has to do with anger. It has to do with the relationship, the very tense relationship between anger and faith. If, as if, if you have anger, if you are angry with the people, then you can't introduce them to faith. You can't bring them faith. That anger has no role in the story of faith. That violence, verbal violence in this case, or physical violence suggested by the stick, by the staff, has no role in a story 
that should have created food. Now, that actually, um, that is a kind of sketch of where we're going. Because in a sense, I am going to be moving on from what the Rambam, from the, what the Rambam here said. Our journey is going to be a little convoluted because we're going to, we're going to move into the journey properly now. Uh, and we're going to be doing this quite quickly, this process of trying to understand Yes. We can't we can't see you. Can you just fix your camera again? It just fell a little bit. Exactly. Great. A little bit Good. more? Yeah. I'm sorry. I see. Here you go. I don't know why it's so yeah. great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Please keep me tuned, you know, so as I know. Okay. Um after all, there was a previous a previous event at the beginning of the 40 years, back in Sefer Shemot where Moshe was told to strike the rock. You may remember. Yes. They came to a place which was also called Masa Meriva. Right? Meriva. It had a similar name, actually. And this is at the end of Parshat Shalach, after uh, the crossing of the Red Sea, after a great experience uh, of faith. The people come to this place. They complain about not having water. It's all very similar. There's even, even been some attempts by modern scholars to say it's actually the same event, uh, repeated from in, in different parts of the in different parts of the Torah. Um, but there are significant differences, and one difference is that Moshe was told at that time, "Lehikita you should <clears throat> you should strike the rock, take the staff and strike the rock." That was the command. And so everything went according to plan. Um, you shall strike the rock and water will come out and the people will drink. And Moshe did so before the eyes of the elders of Israel. And notice the role of eyes in all this. When you have a scene of striking the rock and water coming out, that's clearly a visual scene. It's a dramatic scene, visually. If you strike the rock and whoop, up comes the water. It's glorious. It's glorious technicolor, you could almost say. But speaking to the rock, which is what God commands in, in our parsha, why does God keep saying, you should do this before the eyes of the children of Israel, before their eyes, as if, as if in some sense this is to be also a visual scene. What is visual about this? It should be here, it should say, you should speak to the rock before the ears of the children of Israel. That is, speak in the presence of them. Really, you are addressing their hearing. You want, you want to be heard by them. But the emphasis there, there too is on the eyes. If we go back to the source page now, if you can have a screen with the source page, have a look at how Rashi, the unexpected ways, in which Rashi understands that earlier scene, right, the earlier water from the rock scene. You can see it in number two here. God says to Moshe, and we're going to read it through here. It's full of <laughs> revelations. Moshe had said, in just a moment, they're going to stone me. In the Torah, that in some way he feels the people to be a threat in their complaints, and he's intimidated by them. And God says to him, don't worry. Don't worry, walk in front of the people and you'll see that they won't stone you. Avor lifneha'am, walk in front of them, like, you know, across their whole front. Give them every chance to stone you. Ure'ei in yukhtuluk, see if they stone you. Lama hutseta la'az al Why have you uttered slander? Why have you uttered slander against my children? Why have you uttered slander? In other words, you're speaking Lashon Hara against my, against my children. My camera just doesn't want to be, doesn't want to register me. Okay. Uh, again, the next, the next, the next uh, phrase. And take with you the elders of Israel as witnesses, that they may see that it is by your agency the water will come forth from the rock, and people would say that there had been springs there from time immemorial. In other words, that there will be testimony to the dramatic fact of water issuing, gushing from a rock, 
by definition, you don't think a rock can 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 can, can produce water. Um, and that it's not just that he hit it at a, at, a, at a sensitive spot and old an old spring sprang forth. They will see they will see the difference. And then your staff with which you hit the river. What staff? And suddenly the staff, we're reminded that this staff has been in action before. There's a whole history with the staff. And where it was most powerfully in action was in Egypt, when Moshe struck the river and turned it into blood. Now there, that was an act of striking. That was an act of violence. And here Rashi continues. Um, Israel were saying uh, about the staff that it's there only to do violent things, to do punitive things, like turning water, turning good water into blood. It's there only for dire impact. And that's where how it was through the rod that Paro was, was, was played and the Egyptians were played. All those makot, all those blows of violence in the in the in in Egypt were were mediated by the staff. Moshe was carrying his staff all the time. And that's what a staff is there for. So they would have a fixed idea of what a staff is for. That's why God now says to Moshe, now being in this water from the rock, the earlier water from the rock uh, story, um, God now says to him, um, now you understand that uh, now they will see that this staff can act for good things as well. That this staff is not just a punitive, obvious meaning of a stick, and the stick is there, is there for hitting. And even though you're going to hit the rock, it's going to have a benign purpose. In other words, sometimes a staff is not a staff. Sometimes a rod is not a rod. And that's a rather um, annoying idea I want to be introducing. The simple no notion of a rod is that a rod is there for hitting. Spare the rod and spoil the child, etc., etc. Yes, that that's what rods are for. But it seems that rods are not always there for that. Sometimes rods are there actually to produce water. That they just just they, that's what they're there for in this particular situation. They have a broad range of imaginative uses. Fantasy can produce a number of different associations with rods. The akita batur, and again. Hit doesn't say hit al hatsur on the surface of the rock, but penetrate the rock. The hikita batsur. In other words, this is actually an image. It's a metaphor on for having an impact when you are you are addressing the rock and you're coming to the rock. And presumably, Rashi says here, this this rod was made of some very hard material. It wasn't just uh, wood. It was some kind of metallic material, perhaps, like a jewel, perhaps. But how, how do they say it in the, in the, in the English here? We can move it up a little bit. Um, San Pirion. Can you move it up a little more? more up, um, I mean, down, down. Move it down. Yes. A kind of material called, <laughs> now we need it up. Yes, the name of which is sapphire. All right, translates it sapphire. So the rod was made of some material that really can split things. In other words, what you have here is a sense of the effort to leave an imprint, to write something on the rock, to leave a mark on the rock. And on and, and that occasion, that's what God wanted. But when it comes to this occasion, God didn't want that. God wanted something else. He wanted an imprint to be made on the rock, visually, that it should actually register the impact of a certain force that had come and, and handled it and, and, and treated it. But the force on our occasion, in our part, would not be the stick, but it would be speech. The vision of Moshe speaking to the rock, in other words, not hearing what he said, it wasn't as if the rock would hear what he said. It's almost more tactile. That speaking, like hitting, but in a more symbolic sense, in a more rarefied sense, speaking has the power to penetrate. Speaking has the power to leave a mark. And what God wanted of Moshe was 
that he should represent on some level that power of divine speech, that Moshe represents the divine speech. When he speaks to the people, he is really <clears throat> speaking in the name of God. <clears throat> and if he uses that beautiful expression is, that the, the presence of God spoke from, the, from his throat, from the midst of his throat, it's a very physical expression of Moshe being in some way animated by God, and he said, with all his stammer. That is, the stammer is there, perhaps, to emphasize the opposite of what this was supposed to demonstrate. That is, the stammer is there, uh, the French, great French-Jewish philosopher uh, Levinas um, has, a, has a wonderful statement he makes about how the Torah is suspicious of any rhetoric that does never that never stammers. And that's why Moshe is made as a stammerer. That he is there to stammer, at least sometimes. What why? Because that shows you that the force of revelation, when God speaks, God doesn't forget the weight of the world, the inertia of men and the dullness of human understanding. In other words, God speaks and God knows that the surface is supposed to accept God's speech has all kinds of inhibitions and all kinds of complexities, and in some way, it sets itself against receiving the message. And so what, that's why you needed a person like Moshe who made you feel the difficulty of language. Uh, this is something I've experienced sometimes in listening to, to, to teachers, to lecturers who are extremely effective, even though they clearly have some kind of a handicap. It's the handicap that makes them effective. One feels the, the urgency. One feels the narrow channels of the throat as somewhere there's an attempt to make an impact. And that in itself creates the impact because it's a realistic attempt at communicating with those who may not easily accept communication. When it comes to a stick, it's very easy. If all you have a stick that hits the rock, that's, that's very easy. Just have the stick made of the right material and you can make the point on the rock. But when it comes to speech, what God wanted was a demonstration, a kind of living um, tableau here um, of the power, of the impact, the force of the speaker on the Mechabel, on that which receives. And Rashi actually says it. Um, the people were supposed to think, um, I, I didn't put it on your page, but it's, it's really very powerful. What would the people have said if Moshe had spoken to the rock? And here's another piece for our puzzle. Moshe, the people would have said, that is, they would have used their imagination. And they would have thought, Ma Look at this rock, which doesn't actually need anything. It doesn't see, it doesn't hear, it doesn't need to receive anything into itself. It doesn't need anything from the outside, as it were. It's self-contained. It's an unimpressible rock. It's an unpassionate rock. It's not, it doesn't have to be open in any way. It doesn't need pranasa. I think Rashi actually says that. It doesn't need help in, in, in staying alive. If even the rock responds to God's speech, to Moshe's speech, then how much more so should we? That's the kind of lesson that the people would have learned. And that's the kind of complex lesson. The people would not have just thought, oh, well, he used the, he used the, he used the stick. Right? That's what Moshe thinks is quite sufficient. Moshe used the stick, which is the expression of his power, and he made an impact on the, on the rock. That's not the kind of power that, that God was looking for. God was looking, almost on the contrary, for a suspension of that kind of power. And by a suspension, I mean a situation in which, first of all, that stick, which had been used really for hitting a river and turning it into blood, there is the very sinister use of sticks and rods, really to transform situations in ways that are not happy at all. Right? And they put a note side of, of, of what the rod uh, 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 represents. There, there it had worked just like that. And that was what God had meant at that stage of things. 
But now what God wants, and apparently where has the rod been all this time? It's been Lifnei Hashem. Like the man, like the manna, you can make the analogy. The express, and that's very, in a very, in a passage, you remember the story of the man, of how God gives the man. And then Moshe is told in the same passage in, in Beshalach, in, 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 in Sefer Shemot, where we read about Moshe and the, uh, and the stick and the rock. Uh, there we're, we're told that Moshe then is to put the, the, the manna, a, a jar full, to put it into a jar, fill it and put it into Lufnei Hashem, Lufnei HaEdut, to put it into the Holy of Holies, the moment the Holy of Holies, in the moment the Mishkan is erected. Le Mishmeret Lufnei Hashem, as a kind of almost like a, a museum object which would keep the idea alive in the minds of the people that manna isn't just that all that same old stuff that we get every day. Right? We're used to it at a certain point, and we know it's going to fall every day. Right? And that's already the good news, where we can trust that it will fall every day. Um, that manna is miraculous, to keep a sense of the, of the miracle of it. How would you do that? By withdrawing a sample a piece of manna, this uh, jar full of manna, and framing it, putting it into a museum. It becomes a museum piece. It's not on, on show all the time, but everyone knows that it's there, as if to represent something, to represent the miracle of it, the prodigy of it. It's the Mesha Chokma who says something like this. For our purposes, the interesting thing is that the, st- the staff was also kept in the same way as a kind of memento to times past, when it had been used for rather violent purposes. That's the stuff that really belongs on the whole in Egypt. That's the stuff, Egypt and the time before Matan Torah. That's the stuff that commits obvious violence. That's a cachet thing. It's a hard thing. Hard experiences, harsh experiences. And that is what is supposed to impress the people. That, that the power of God, the power of God impresses the people. But there comes a time when that apparently is no longer the way things are supposed to get. That what we have from that time onwards is the need to impress the people visually, right? a scene. There's to be a visual impression, not of that land that doesn't originate of something that doesn't originate in that land of violence, which is Egypt. And one has to notice that Egypt is, it's a place of Makot. That's the place where Makot belongs, right? That's a place where you see, you see the impact and then how, right? But even there, Pharaoh's heart demonstrated quite fully how coveted it was, how resistant it was, because he was Egypt. You really need to pull out all the stops to make any kind of mark on that kind of heart. But now we are after Matan Torah. And it seems that, that God wants Moshe somehow to push the people to a kind of imaginative, we call it to push their moral imagination, a kind of imaginatively moral openness to begin to take on the unlikely idea that words can leave a deep impact. That it's simply the force of words that now, from now on, what will they have after Matan Torah? They will have the story of Matan Torah. There will be no repeat of Matan Torah. The sheer force of that event, that the people fled physically, turned around and fled. They fled from the force of the event. What they are left with after Matan Torah is the story of Matan Torah and the Mitzvah to tell the story of Pesach, but not only on Pesach, on the Shema. In other words, an attempt to affect that the impact of a certain experience of force should be available to the person who is receiving, that there should be a surface, a receptive surface. And the people are now moving into a world in which they need to sensitize their surface. These words in the Shema, these words shall be upon your heart. Does it mean be upon your heart? It's not the same as with Samtem, it has a Tvera is. You shall place them upon your heart. That's in the second chapter of the Shema. But in the first chapter, we read, they shall be upon your heart. 
uh, Rav Hutner, Rav Yitzhak Hutner, one of, one of the great 20th century Jewish philosophers, um, who is only known in Hebrew. I, oh, actually, I think there is a bit of something in a translation. At any rate, he has a, a series of extraordinary discussions of texts, shall we say. Um, he says the Hayu is translated by Targum, an Aramaic tar Targum, Targum Yonatan. They shall be imprinted on your heart, imprinted on the tablets of your heart. That is, this is not keep, keep the memory of it alive. Keep the memory of everything you've gone through, of the scene of Matan Torah, for instance, the stories. Keep them alive by constantly repeating them, constantly telling the story. That would be you shall place them on your heart. But for Hayu, it should, is a reference to God's desire, the divine desire, that we should live in a state of deep awareness. Let's say deepening awareness. That, that's what, why we have all these commandments. Remember, don't forget. Remember, don't forget. One way of remembering and not forgetting is to keep repeating the story. But there is another thing. And the other thing is, if somewhere the impact to start with was so deep that speech could begin to flow about it, that those who receive the impact could begin talking about it, and that their ears would be open, would be sensitized to God saying further things to them, even if in a less uh, dramatic, uh, dramatic way. And there you have that idea then of love rather than fear. The ahafta de There's somewhere a sense that there's something to be cherished that one has deep in one's heart, and that therefore one doesn't want to blur over, wants to try to avoid that death impulse, that death wish, which makes everything neutral. It makes everything just a matter of habit and, and, and repetition. That is the enemy. And against that, God says, remember, try to find ways of being more alive to the power of speech in your, in, in, in your life. As we go back to the screen, um, and look at some more sources. Um, I want to skip to number four. Uh, and just to look again at another of those scenes with the rod and to, to say something quite, quite brief about this. Um, God, uh, God asks Moshe at the burning bush, we're going right back to, to chapter four. Moshe had just said, I can't speak. They are not going to believe me. They're not going to listen to me. I can't speak. What is that in your head? Why is it written in one word? Why isn't it ma ze? But you could read it actually as mize biadecha. And here Rashi offers a midrashic answer. Mize biadecha. From that which is in your hand, you have to be punished. That is, you have a stick in your hand and it's going to punish you now. You're holding it in your hand, and that's why you have to be punished. Because you were suspicious of, of impeccable people, of kasher people. In other words, you are attacking and criticizing and suspecting your people. You don't believe that they are capable of any that. And I am saying to you now that you are not capable of believing of having faith, of trusting in their power of trust. And if you don't believe in them, where should they get their power of trust? Now, this is quite a, an accusation to make against, and it's in Rashi, it's not in from um, Recherche, uh, Hasidic source. That is in some way, it's, it's a mainline meaning that somewhere there is this sense that, 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 that Moshe was speaking evil speech about the people. He couldn't really trust. There's something in him that lacks trust of the people's capacity to have trust. Like a parent who doesn't trust the child. Right? I can think of that analogy. A parent who is overcritical of the child, which means probably critical, <laughs> critical of the child. Uh, it's one thing to notice problems, another thing to be critical, to have a tendency to criticism. A parent who is critical of the child is in some way disabling the child. The child needs to have a parent who trusts 
him on some level without being naive, but who trusts him. It was you, it's your hand now that's liable to punish me. And what happens then, you remember, the stick, which seemed to be one thing, it's a stick, turns into a snake. And suddenly life has gone out of control. And suddenly Moshe understands that there's a kind of visceral response. Moshe has to run away from the snake. In other words, he knows now what it is to be addressed by something that he, he thought was okay, which turns out to be overpowering. And he runs away. And then it returns. And then his hand also can't be trusted. Right? There's a sense suddenly now that everything turns against him, things that are apparently part of his world of meaning. And it's that that Moshe has in some way to move towards engaging with. If we move down on the page now, again, um, um, Ariel, move down now. Um, Moshe says to God, at one moment uh, in that same scene back at uh, the burning bush, um, where are we? Number 4B. God says, do these signs with your hands and your stick turning into something else. You're doing it for the people, the Hemini. They will, they will believe in you. When you. What will they believe? Really, this is for you. This, is, this sign is for you. What is for the people? You will tell them that I have been punished for your sake because I spoke evil about you. That's the story. That's the words that Moshe should convey to the people. That's the sign. It's not the miracle of this turning into that. That's an intimate sign for Moshe himself. But it's a story that Moshe will make of it that will affect the people. And what's the story? That he is being punished for your sake, for slandering the people. Then they will believe you. Then they will trust you. In other words, it's quite an extraordinary uh, um, interpretation. They will trust you. That is, they will really, they will trust God. And they will understand that anyone who attacks them is bound for punishment. In other words, that God loves them. That God loves them and doesn't tolerate punishment, um, slander, even from Moshe himself. Now, there's a, there's a lot more we could, we could elaborate on this, but that is sufficient somewhere to give the idea that what Moshe is being taught here is the art of interpretation. He is to interpret the sign for himself in one way, and then to know a story, to think of a story to tell the people that will make meaning trustworthy meaning, meaning that's creative and imaginative for the people, meaning that will move them onwards. Uh, Moshe still hasn't finished in that scene. He says, send by whoever you want to send by. Don't use me as a messenger. He still is very disenchanted, very un unwilling to be involved. And there again, Rashi comments, send by whoever you want to send, because I know on some level that it's not my role to bring this people into the land. There will be some other redeemer. And here Moshe has, so early in the story, according to the Midrash, way before any strikings of rocks and any gzerot, any decrees. So early in the story, at the moment when he's being commissioned to save the people and bring them into the land, he already knows on some deep level, he knows that he will not be the one to finish the job. That he, and that's why he says, send a messenger from the beginning of the story who is the messenger who will finish the story. That's, that's Rashi's Midrashic reading. As if Moshe has a deep knowledge that he is not really made for that role of taking the people into the land all the way. And that, that perhaps on some level is why Moshe is so um, bleak in a way about the people's possibilities. Since he is not the one who is going to usher them into the land, there is, he is very aware of the people's failings. And his level of criticism of the people somewhere maintains itself till we come to that scene by the rock. And here, um, if we can go back to the source page now, we can do that. Yes, uh, we can go back to number three, up. The screen up. Yes. Yes. 
And this is a long passage of Ramban, and I don't have time to, to do it in any detail. Uh, I do want to just look at the beginning of the second paragraph. What was that scene when Moshe took his stick, right? Perik is good in, in Sefer Shmat, right? That same scene with where he spoke, where he hit, where he hits the room, yes. He went up, mm-hmm. the staff of God in my hand. He went up there. Uh, in fact, if you move it down to the translation, I think you can just read the translation. I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase it very briefly. Ramban has a very interesting suggestion. He takes the stick in his hand, and the stick is clearly, the most obvious meaning of the stick is a stick of power and violence, a representative, a symbol of the, the, in, the irresistible power of God and the people. That they're, that they're going to defeat Amalek. And he's, he's taking the stick in his hand, and obviously it's meant as an expression of power. And Ramban says, no, there are two positions of the stick. It's a kind of binary situation. When it's a matter of the people fighting, then the stick is in his hand. But Moshe has another option. And the other option is the really powerful option. The other option is to drop the stick as it says you know, at the end of the first paragraph, his hands spread heavenward and saying many prayers. The other option is prayer. Prayer is holding his hands empty and open without anything in his hand. The people seeing that is a kind of posture of surrender, we'd almost say. But it's surrender to God. It's a kind of connection with God. It's opening the hands to connect you have a kind of flow of energy upwards to connect with God and have God flow with you. And then it would affect the people to have trust in him as the vehicle that brings God's power down to them. In other words, what you have here is another visual scene. And the people would be Mr. Klin Klape Mala. They would look upwards and what they would see would make them Submit, surrender their hearts to God. He quotes that famous passage in the uh, in, in Rosh Hashanah. But the most powerful version of that was it was just his empty hands. That was where the real, the electric current really was, was, was set going, and the people had enough trust. Trust in Moshe, trust in their future that whenever they would be in trouble, they would have the one necessary um, resource, um, even in a situation of no power at all, of helplessness. And the one resource would be that connection with God through Moshe, in some way that Moshe would no longer be with them. And this parsha, this is our parsha now, parsha Chukat, is the moment in the narrative where it becomes clear, totally clear, that this is the end of a generation, that Moshe is not going to be with them, that Aaron is not going to be with them, that Miriam is not going to be with them. That is all their vehicles, all their connecting media that made them sense God's love and God's constancy. By the time we get to this parsha, we know that Moshe had to have taught them by this time everything they need to know to continue without him. And that means translating the mate, the staff, from its crude meaning as an expression of power and violence to the meaning that is already starting in that battle against Amalek, where the people still, and uh, the, the, the uh, Midrash and the Chilta says, the people learn how to pray in future. And that's how we pray now. We watch the Shliach Tzibur, in some way, he's the focus. When he bows, we bow. When he, he says, Korea, he kneels down, we do. In other words, there is a sense of focusing visually on a vehicle to bring the prayers upwards and to bring a sense of trust and faith as a kind of life, a life force uh, up and down again. Now, that is supposed to, to be a lesson to the people. The mate is put out of commission after this, and then it's brought out 40 years later, roughly, on this occasion, our occasion now, with the rock. So what do we have now? What do we have now that will help us to understand in some detail what is happening here and what was supposed to be happening? 
um, notice, if we go back to the, yeah, oh, we're on the source page, good. So if we can go down now, we go down to number six. The Meshachokma is not translated. Um, the Meshachokma, uh, another of uh, the cluster of late 19th century commentaries um, who help us somewhere, who are our vehicle, who help us move off the ground, move, move upwards. What, what does he say here? That the point of the whole story here at Meib Me, Me Riva is as a kind of reenactment of a moment of revelation that people had had at Har Sinai. Shabbat Hayam Matan Torah Nit Alu Yisrael V'Ra'u Hakolot. What was the most extraordinary impingement that happened then, where the voices came from God, voices of, of some kind, and they saw the voices. They achieved a certain kind of, call it mystical condition in which they had a certain vividness of receptivity that allowed them to take in those voices into themselves, almost like, I would say, almost like touch, that the voices penetrated them. And it's called Ra'u. Um, there is a, I think, rather well-known uh, notion. Actually, it's, an, it's, a, it's a condition. It's a, a neurological condition that's called synesthesia. Synesthesia is where, you know, people say that uh, this sound tasted to me like garlic. <laughs> I was listening to the music and it tasted to me like honey. But it's sometimes very specific. And it's not a medicine. For people who really have synesthesia as a neurological condition, it's meant quite literally. The sense is crossed. That is, there is such a vivid sense of the inner reality of what is coming in from the outside the music, let's say, that's coming in from the outside, that you can't call it hearing. It's Kabbalah, but it's Kabbalah in a very profound sense. They saw what could only be heard. That's how Rashi translates it. And he, uh, here, the Meshachokma brings uh, a Midrash that actually that enacts that scene and says, what was it to see the audible, to see the commandments? It was an angel bringing out from the presence of God, he would bring, present each person each individual with that dibur, with that speech of God, with that act of speech of God. And he would say to them, do you accept upon you this commandment? And we usually read that as, do you accept to obey it? Yes, do you, do you agree to obey it? And, they, and there's a list here, of what it implies, all the things it implies, the punishments and warnings and so on. And that was the very personal confrontation that the people had with the demands of Sinai. And suggesting, and I think the Meshachuk might suggest, that it's not just, are you willing to sign on the dotted line? Are you willing to sign the contract? Makabel, in that sense. But do you really allow it to register in you? Do you allow it to be on your heart? Is there some kind of appreciation of onik? Do we come back to, to what we talked about at the beginning of the series? Um, the actual onik shahayasham alashem. That that powerful impact had something about it almost too, too blissful. That the people somewhere flinched at. And here the idea is that they did allow themselves, at least for one moment, to be mekabel. Yeah. And now there comes a moment 40 years later when Moshe wants the people to have a repeat of that experience. The Yuro Imita Nishma. And this will would strengthen their trust now as they're about to enter the land and as they're about to enter into another covenant with God. This is just before um, that covenant in Arvot Mu'ad, two, four, six lines down there. So God wanted at this crucial moment to strengthen their power of receptivity, their power of really taking it in deep, a kind of depth, a kind of depth of sensibility, rather than just a commitment on a formal sense. And that's what this rock was meant to suggest. There is the idea that we're going to see 
not only in the Mesha Chokmah, but in two other um, very powerful commentaries, each one in a different way. The rock, yes, thank you for highlighting, the rock is affected, mit pa'el, mit pa'el is hit pa'el, yes. It's about the most stark way possible of saying that you are, right, the, the rock represents me in a function that doesn't seem to belong to rocks. Right? A rock is not mit pa'el, right? we might say. That is not what a rock, a rock is not soft, a rock is not impressible. It's the opposite. You know, I am a rock, isn't there a... A song, wasn't there a song at one time? I actually, I can read it, I took a, I photographed the song because it came into my mind. Uh, the singer is singing, I am a rock, I am an island, I've built walls, a fortress, yes. I have no need of friendship, friendship causes pain, it's laughter and it's loving, I disdain. I am a rock, I am an island, don't talk of love, but I've heard the word before, it's sleeping in my memory. It's sleep, that's exactly what I'm trying to talk about. The feeling of things being, things that should be alive, somewhere slumbering. Simon and Garfunkel, right, right. It's sleeping in my memory, I don't want to disturb the slumber of feelings that have died. And God wants that that slumber should be penetrable that somewhere people should have the capacity to get past that neutral position. It's a, it's a terrible neutral, it's an aggressively neutral position. I am a rock, I am an island, I have my books, I have all kinds of ways of hiding, I touch no one and no one touches me. And in the last stanza, I am a rock, I am an island, and a rock feels no pain, and an island never cries. And that's the end of the, the, end of the song. And here is a rock that God wants to demonstrate its unrockness, its unrockishness, the fact that a rock can be affected by language. That's the visual miracle. You're supposed to see the rock buckling under the impact of Moses' words, of Moshe's words, which are the words of God. But what did Moshe do? He spoke angrily. Shim unahamorim. It's a wonderful interpretation because it's not the anger, it's not just that he calls them you rebels. That's clearly not a pleasant way of speaking. He's attacking them. It's verbal violence. Right? He's using words like, like uh, blunt weapons, I'd say. He's, he's not using words softly. He's using words in a very uh, harsh way. But the Meshach Ochmah wants to say more than that. He says, Moshe didn't do what God wanted, which was to prepare their sense of sight. That is, not their sense of hearing, their sense of sight. That is, that sense which in a way is impressible, much more impressible. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the word of God didn't do anything yeah, because Moshe was angry. Moshe was in a way resisting that kind of softness that would be implied in what the eye can can see as an effect on the rock, the effect of lying language on a rock. And therefore, he had to hit the rock. And that's kind of plan B, you know, that, he, that he had to hit the rock. And we don't know, actually, if that was so effective. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't know whether Mayim Rabim is better than Mayim. Uh, what happened was not what God had wanted. Even if the impact was in a way very dramatic of the stick hitting the rock, it wasn't as dramatic as, in a way, the absurd impact of sheer words impacting on hard stone. And that's what God had wanted. Can we move down now? And we move to the Hamik Dover, another long passage. Um, for those of you who can, please do read these passages. They are they're pure gold. Here I'm going again just to try to pick out what I think of as the, as the central theme. Find my first page. The Hamik Dover. Yes. The Dibartan Dover. You shall speak to the rock. You shall speak to the rock. It's clear that the rock can't hear, says the Hamic Dava, the Nitzvah of Velocity, in a very sensible way. So what do you mean, speak to the rock? It can't mean that. 
not speak to the rock, but speak in the presence of the rock. In the presence of the rock, speak to the people. And what kind of speech? And here the Hermic Devar has a really innovative uh, reading of the whole story. He says, the resource of water that the people now no longer have, and that's why they complain about what, not having water, was Miriam's well. Miriam's well accompanied them. It was a rock that rolled through the desert and produced water. And that miracle is no longer there. It's she dies and the miracle stops. And then he makes a, a twist. He said that miracle was no longer a miracle. That miracle had become part of nature. Instead, it's just like water is falling from the heaven or a spring springing up from the ground. It had, that rock producing water was part of the way of nature by this time for the people. Um, and what God wanted now was that the people should experience their own ability to work with the laws of nature, not to be dependent on stark revelations, stark miracles from God, but that to, be, uh, to be confident enough and trusting enough in their ability to make the, ra- the rain fall. And their ability would be basically through the mouth, through prayer and through Torah. And so there is a midrash that the, that the, mesh, that the Hamid Davar uh, refers to about what people should do in the future when there is a thought, when there is a drought, atzirat yeah? shamim. That is, it's a natural disaster. Nothing to do with miracles. The equivalent of that natural disaster is the rock no longer producing water here. What do you do in such a situation in the future? A lot of instructions in the Marayan Sutta. The whole community should gather together, should speak a chapter of halacha, that is, should learn Torah together, speak in the presence of the rock, and then should, there should be tefillat rabbit, there should be prayer. And in some way, the learning of Torah is connected with, you, you can know it's doing something when it leads to prayer. And that kind of very profound expression of the people's deep trust in God, which would be just a matter of using their own abilities to learn Torah as a, as a community and to pray in the presence of God. And here Moshe was, was intended actually to rehearse them in that enactment. They would would get their first experience of this, of speaking in the presence of the rock, not to the rock, but doing this rather absurd thing of trying to affect the rock, which is withholding its water, like any natural resource that's not, not working properly, affect the rock using divine human words. What does Moshe do? Partly because of his anger, I think he also refers to the anger, Look later, later on, what the Moshe does is, he, in a way, uh, he, he misses the opportunity to have the people recognize their fully natural resources, what is within the capacity, the repertoire of a human being to do in a time of drought. And instead, he produces the same old miracle. It's a very original reading. He does what he did before. He strikes the rock. In some ways, he is, he is not taking in deeply enough what God's will is of this occasion. God had not said strike the rock, and he didn't take it seriously enough. He just kind of, in a way, went on automatic. That going on automatic, there is something about that um, that is catastrophic. There's something about that that leaves the people unprepared to live to live the Torah and to live the revelation for all the future properly in the way of nature. And I just wanted to say one word about that before we finish. Uh, in the way of nature would mean, what is the way of nature? It would mean that the wilderness is the wilderness and Eretz Yisrael is Eretz Yisrael. And that really, and this is a, a view that the Hermit Devar developed throughout his commentary, that somewhere the people had made already an unconscious choice not to live according to miracles in their future. They couldn't stand the tension and the, the, the in a way, the, the excessive impact of that way of living. 
and they wanted to live Kadarche Hatev, Kadarche Hatev. They wanted to live a natural human life and find ways of finding their spiritual resources in the means and methods of halacha and tefillah and Torah. That is, that all these things would penetrate them and would in some way be live presences within them so that no miracles would be needed. Now, that is it's an ongoing theme in, in the Hamic Bepeh. And this is a moment of severe failure then on the part of Moshe when he simply enacts the mercy. What happens at the very end of the story? At the very end of the story, you remember, Moshe takes two tablets of stone. I'm sorry, it's not the end of the story. Uh, um, I'll explain what I mean in a minute. At the very end of the Torah, we read something about all the signs and wonders that Moshe had done before the eyes of the children of Israel, before Le'ene Kol Israel. Those are the last words of the Torah. That is, that all the things, all the wonders that he had done, the signs and the miracles that he had done, had been before their eyes. One level of that can be read as simply, he had done amazing things, and they were all eyewitnesses to the miracles of the wilderness. And he was a means of these miracles. However, Rashi, if so you can go back to the screen now. Um, we go back to the screen, and I want to look at number five. Going back up, up in the screen. We're zigzagging. Yes, thank you. Le'enei kol Yisrael. In the end, this is the final summary of Moshe's life. That somewhere he had been inspired. Now, this is a flashback to the time when he had smashed those stone tablets. He had smashed those tablets before their eyes. There again, I, I smashed them before your eyes, Moshe remembers in several That stroke, that moment was a stroke of genius. The Sa'olibo. That suddenly something deep within him was totally sensitive to what God really wanted. And what God really wanted was a kind of iconoclasm. It's a breaking of all objects, of all things, of rods that can can break things, and instead a kind of dissolution of all that, leaving all that aside, and being left actually with nothing except the words of God, right? being left with words. And here God agreed with what Moshe had decided so audaciously to do, to break the tablets on which were imprinted. Right? There you have a clear demonstration of how stone can accept imprint of letters, as right? a kind of concrete, almost um, um, scandalous representation of that idea, that stone can register things. And what God wanted was something else. And Moshe, in the end, somewhere, the feeling is that she, you broke those obvious things, the things that are the stones, and you knew, you knew and you know before you die, and in your last speeches to the people, is on your words to the people, that the whole future of that inner, that inner penetration, that Baha'iyu and Levavcha, it shall be on your heart, that it depends entirely on, on that. And in that sense, we, we get a sense that before the end, he realizes what he's really done. Somewhere before the end, he realizes that he has moved on from that view of things, which had to do with power and violence and force, which grew in Egypt, and which in the end, God wants to transmute into a different portable, softer, more joyful. If you have a chance, please do look at the Maharal uh, on your page in number eight. If we can move down there, I'll just take a minute to, to, to look at it with you. What is this mysterious story? Everyone starts by talking about how mysterious the story is. Why is Moshe punished here? This is a very, very mysterious story. Mislam od mu'od. But don't, don't be in any doubt that what God wanted when he told him to speak to the rock, right? he doesn't say it's not a miracle. That's not what he's interested in saying. He said it was a miracle that a rock receives words. And you can demonstrate that words can make a rock. 
you know, buckle. And God wanted that everyone that was standing there should receive the word of God, be nimshachim, should be drawn after the word of God, beratzon, rak b'dibor, with with free will, beratzon really means with desire, that is to be drawn and with desire, these are erotic terms, that what God wanted was a kind of demonstration, not of the impact of force of a rod, but of the impact of language which creates desire, b'dibor b'lvad, b'sibcha, v'hu b'atzmo in yan ha'enina. And it's just really, it's, a, it's an endlessly beautiful passage, it seems to me. Um, that is not by anger, because anger can prove only the power of force. That's all that anger can prove. I'll make you do this. I'll make you love. And obviously, that's not love. I'll make you trust. If it's done through words, however, he says, as the Hamik the verse says, also, there's an Indian, there's an issue here of softness, rakut. Words are supposed to be soft. And words, therefore, can create trust and create faith. And therefore, even a rock will be drawn, into that wonderful expression, drawn towards Rison Goro, Me'atsmu. So we have here an autonomous, a, kind of, a fantasy of what should have been, and which in a way still can be. That is the secret of Torah Shabal Peh, of the old law, and a sense, therefore, of a kind of sweet jouissance, yeah, of an ultimate movement, which is a natural movement of being drawn towards something sweet. Um, that has the power to renew trust. There can be no trust uh, except through the way of desire, and joy. And that's exactly what the Rambam says. Well, there's the Rambam of many possible endings here. Uh, the Rambam who says that, uh, that that's how we fulfill the commandment of the Ahafta. The Ahafta de Shem Elokecha. How do we fulfill the Ahafta? When we actually love learning Torah. <laughs> yes, when learning Torah is something we are the kabel with joy in ourselves. That means loving God. Love it, loving the Torah is what it means uh, to love God. Um, so we're at the end of our series. Um, and um, I want to thank you very much for all, all for being here and for your beautiful faces, those of you who, who are there. And I'll say goodbye to you for the, for the meantime.